the uh, partner was Kung Sopad. However, I did not know who she was because she was amongst the hundreds of women in the four women's groups. And by the time we were called to uh, present ourselves at the marriage ceremony in the kitchen hall near the centaine de femmes dans les quatre groupes de femmes. À l'époque, nous avons été convoqués pour nous présenter à la cérémonie de mariage dans le réfectoire situé près de la pagode de Prétit. Can you tell the chamber whether you made a, a proposal to the Khmerus to marry the woman Sopat? Did you fall in love with her? Êtes-vous tombé amoureux d'elle? No, I did not. How could I have such feelings at the time? Réponse non. Comment pouvais-je avoir de tels sentiments à l'époque? Je ne pouvais pas. I myself was so exhausted. I was forced to overwork. Moi-même, tellement épuisé. For that reason, I did not have any feeling regarding raison, this matter, let alone marrying a woman. Sur ce sujet. However, it was their plan ne that I had to get married. Femme. Toutefois, c'était leur plan que je me marie. And of course, I was targeted to be sûr, imprisoned, and for that reason, I did not dare to protest against raison, any assignment. Pas I would do whatever I was asked. Je faisais tout ce qu'on me demandait. Later that afternoon, Mr. Maisarun described what happened after his marriage as in the following video clip. Please play a clip number 15. When the company chief or the mobile unit chief organizes such a wedding, they will deploy militiamen to monitor the newlywed couples. They actually had a list of those militiamen to go and monitor the newlywed couples. And if the newlywed couples did not consummate the marriage, then they would take measures, although I did not know what measures they would take. Finally, against the weight of evidence, Nunchi argues that militia monitoring newlywed to see affirme if they consummated marriages could not have happened because it would run against the cultural norms concerning sex. It is sufficient to note in response to that to this that violating cultural norms was the norm for the CPK. For instance, it also violated cultural norms to disrobe Buddhist men and force them to marry and to work. However, that did not stop the CPK. Indeed, the whole marriage process instituted by the CPK violated the cultural norms. Your Honours, the evidence in regards to these crimes is weighty, extensive, painful and irrefutable. It is untouched in any meaningful way by the argument of the defense in their briefs. We asked you to find Nunchi and Kirsten guilty of the crime against the humanity of other inhumane acts in regards to forced marriage and rapes within those 
marriages. Commis dans le cadre de ces mariages. I will now turn the floor over Je passe maintenant la parole to Sydney Assistant Prosecutor, the Lysac, to address the security centers. Qui parlera des centres de sécurité. President, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Council, Merci, you may proceed. Good afternoon, uh, Your Honors, uh, Council. Um, the subject I will address, I will start to address today and mostly tomorrow morning, uh, is the crimes uh, that were committed at the four uh, security or re education offices uh, that are part of this trial. Uh, the Tramcock District Prison, known as Krang to Chan, uh, the division. 801 Military Prison uh, in Ratnakiri, known as Okanseng, uh, the Sector uh, 105 uh, Prison, uh, the Sector uh, Prison located in Mandalkiri, uh, known as Phnom Krao, and of course the S21 Prison in Phnom Penh. Uh, these were just four of 196 security offices uh, that were identified by DC CAM uh, in its mapping project uh, that were in operation uh, during this regime. And if we can show slide one, uh, this map shows the locations of, of some of the prisons and execution sites identified uh, throughout this country. Hundreds of thousands of people murdered at these sites. Killings that left a hole in an entire generation of Cambodians that is still felt today in this country. A few months ago, I was struck by something uh, that speaks to the importance of this part of the case and why we are here today. Uh, in April, uh, Amnesty International uh, issued its annual report on the total number of executions worldwide last year. And in 2016, uh, excluding China, for which there is not reliable data, there were a total of 1,032 executions reported by Amnesty International worldwide. The largest number by far was from Iran, which executed 567 people, followed by Saudi Arabia with 154. Those who advocate the cause of international human rights are rightfully alarmed by those numbers. For me, it was also a reminder of the enormity of the crimes that we have been entrusted with prosecuting. In one month alone, the month of May 1978, at least 1,074 prisoners were executed at S21, more than the entire worldwide total for 2016. 582 of those executions occurred on a single day, the 27th of May, 1978 more than the yearly total for the largest country on Amnesty International's list in one day at one prison. The execution numbers from S21, I remind you, represent just one of almost 200 security offices throughout democratic Kampuchea. The scale of killings is an unimaginable atrocity. Anyone, anyone who would say that the prosecution of the Khmer Rouge leaders 
is winner's justice. It's either in utter denial or simply oblivious to the reality and scope of the atrocities that took place here. There were no trials when those prisoners from S-21 were walked out to the mass grave pits of Chengek in May 1978, clubbed on the head and their throat slit. No trials, no appeals, no lawyers, no law. Many of those victims that month were people from the East Zone, brought to S-21 barely long enough to have their names registered then hauled by the truckload to Chengek for execution. As we have heard from Doik, all under the orders of one of the men on trial, Nunchea, a brother number two, the former deputy secretary of the Communist Party of Kampuchea. I'd like to show you just a few of the faces of the over 1,000 victims that killed that month at this one prison. This is Du Zaban, a 24-year-old woman who was the head of a mobile unit in Chutil Commune, Sviring District, sent to S21 on the 17th of May 1978 and killed that same day. Kovana was a 25-year-old clerk from the Romia Heck District Office, executed on the 5th of May. Chesan was the former Grunk ambassador to the Soviet Union, and he was one of the over 580 prisoners killed on the 27th of May, 1978. And this photo is Vin Thi Nok, a 13-year-old Vietnamese girl from Sphi Ring, who entered S21 on the 6th of May, 1978, and was executed a week later on the 14th of May. Her eight-year-old brother, eight-year-old brother, and her father were executed later that same month during the mass killing of 27 May. Although I will talk only about the four uh, DK security offices um, that are part of our case, uh, make no mistake, the same thing was taking place throughout this country this entire country, in every zone, every military division, every ministry, pursuant to a party line or policy generated, directed by the leaders in Phnom Penh. This document here, E31094, for your reference, uh, is the monthly report uh, from the West Zone for the month of July 1978. Uh, it, is, it is lengthy, a 14-page document, uh, and it contains an extremely detailed report uh, for the party center leaders uh, on purported enemies who were being arrested, imprisoned, interrogated and smashed in each sector and district of that zone. Uh, on the first page uh, begins a section titled The Activities of the Hidden Enemy Burrowing from Within. Uh, this section consumes well over half of the report. It starts by referencing elements of the 17 April, including former civil servants and some Chinese and Yuan aliens. And it then makes a clear statement of the party policy the zones had been instructed to implement with regard to such enemy elements. And I quote, 
we have had plans in place to apply the party's assignment line to routinely remove, screen, and sweep clean them. And then what then follows, Your Honours, uh, in this lengthy report are many pages identifying people considered to have engaged in enemy conduct. The report includes uh, people who criticized the party's marriage policy, including a worker uh, at his own factory who told young woman, quote, if you love your parents, don't get married with cadres. Also a woman who worried in the future Ankar will arrange marriage for one man to marry five women. The report includes people who dared to complain, to complain of having to work too hard, not having enough food to eat, uh, or that Ankar had broken up their families and separated them from their children. It reports a man who was sent to a re-education office merely because it was discovered he was a French national who during the former regime was a musician who sang and played music for foreigners. And as in almost every such report that we have seen, uh, there are numerous people identified as soldiers from the former regime. And a section uh, you have heard but is of immense importance. Uh, when we get to the report for Sector 37 of the West Zone, it is reported in this sector, I quote, smashed 100 ethnic yuns, including small and big, adults and children, smashed 60 persons who had been from the ranking group as well as the CIA of the American imperialists who were hiding in the units and cooperatives. It then discusses elements who were lazy, opposing Ankar, cursing at people, being implicated in many confessions and refusing to work. And it concludes by describing the measures the zone planned to take in regard to these enemy activities. That is, and I quote, continue to search for all kinds of networks of the hidden enemy burrowing from within and sweep them clean continuously and absolutely from the bases, units, offices, and various departments. Your Honours, um, one other important point about the timing of this report. It was sent in early August 1978, uh, and that is about four months after uh, the Centre had purged and sent to S21 uh, the, sec the former secretary of the West Zone, Chu Chet. So this is a report that is coming from the new leader that was put in place uh, by the leaders in Phnom Penh, Pol Pot, Nun Chea, Pan, and others, trusted to take control of the zone and implement the party center's policies. And this is just one report from one zone for one month in a regime that lasted three and a half years. The accused, Your Honours, um, were, were well aware of what was going on in this country. The National Co-Prosecutor talked about that uh, today. Um, she uh, brought to your attention uh, a very important document, uh, the 8th March 1976 Standing Committee uh, meeting, uh, E3232. And the importance of this uh, is, as we know, um, 
standing committee meetings were attended not only by Noon Chea, but also by Kusum Pan. Uh, a fact he admitted to OCIJ uh, and which is also shown by the surviving standing committee minutes. And in this uh, very critical surviving record, uh, any doubt, uh, any doubt is removed that both of these accused attended meetings at which they received reports from regional leaders on the enemy situation uh, in their territories. It is plainly documented, documented in those minutes uh, in which the sector uh, and zone leaders came to Phnom Penh that they reported on enemies who had been arrested. They asked for instructions from Ankar, and they were given, in this case, specific instructions to conduct further interrogations and report the responses to the upper echelon. There is no doubt, Your Honours, that the accused, both of them, knew and were involved in these matters. We are very, very fortunate that uh, some of these reports and telegrams uh, survived uh, the effort of the CP CPK leadership uh, to destroy the paper trail of their crimes. This evidence refutes uh, any claim that they did not know what was taking place. They knew, and they knew in excruciating detail. These documents and any argument that the zones were operating autonomously and contrary to the wishes of the center. You can see from the numbering sequence in the telegrams that report, reports, telegrams, were sent from the zones to the center on almost a daily basis. For anyone who wants to know the truth of this regime, read these documents. They are telling. We are also fortunate that uh, of the 196 security centers uh, in operation during the Khmer Rouge regime, there were two uh, that uh, failed to destroy at least all of their records uh, before the Vietnamese arrived, S-21 and Krang Tachan. It, it is in significant part because of the survival of records from those two prisons uh, that there is no serious dispute about the crimes that took place there. And we also have critical evidence that corroborates the accounts uh, of survivors from other democratic Kampuchea prisons. Indeed, uh, one of the two defense teams, the Q Pond team, uh, has conceded in its trial brief that the evidence from S-21 establishes murder, extermination, enslavement, imprisonment, other inhumane acts, torture, and political persecution. Uh, in my submissions, uh, continuing tomorrow, uh, I will address uh, the crimes against humanity that I believe uh, are most uh, closely associated with the security offices. Uh, that will be uh, the crimes of imprisonment, other inhumane acts against human dignity, torture, and uh, last but not least, murder and extermination. I will discuss the evidence from these uh, security centers uh, that most, the evidence that most convincingly approves these crimes. And I will make some submissions uh, on the two accused's responsibility for these crimes. Let me now start um, with the crime 
of imprisonment. Je vais commencer par le crime d'emprisonnement. Your Honours, uh, the crime against humanity of imprisonment uh, means this. It means the deprivation of an individual's liberty arbitrarily. That is, uh, without a justifiable legal basis, due process of law. There is little dispute, uh, based on the evidence you have heard, that thousands of victims were deprived of their liberty and forcibly detained at Krang Tachan, Phnom Krao, Ho Khan Seng, and S21. Amongst the hundreds of witnesses you have heard, not a single person claims there were any courts, judges, judicial bodies, or criminal laws and procedures in place in democratic Kampuchea. <coughs> Not even the most loyal, die-hard former Khmer Rouge cadres. It was the party leaders and the party leaders alone who decided who would be arrested, sent to security offices, and smashed. What took place was the very, the very definition of arbitrary and extrajudicial imprisonment and execution. In addition to the witnesses uh, who have testified there were no courts, uh, the victims who were arrested and detained without any opportunity to defend themselves often without even receiving any reason for their arrest. There are also surviving documents uh, that show us the reality of how so many people were branded enemies by the party, deprived of their freedom and, in many cases, their lives. At Okansang, you heard from two survivors of the Okansang prison, Pantol and Moon Chandi. They were workers at the Northeast Zone rubber plantation, uh, who in mid-June 1977 uh, were arrested along with 10 other workers uh, from the rubber union and taken to Okansang. Moon Chandi was pregnant at the time. They were not told the reason for their arrest, just that they were going to study with Ankar. Why were these rubber plantation workers arrested? Let me show you a, a telegram that was sent by Northeast Zone Secretary V to the party leaders in Phnom Penh on the 15th of June, 1977, around the very time these workers were arrested. In this telegram, the zone secretary writes, quote, it is decided that Comrade T take secret measure to take out the contemptible persons burrowing within rubber and cotton plantations as well as mobile units. The target of this purge, if you read the telegram, was to be a number of quote-unquote networks of four persons who were identified as contemptibles. Your Honours, uh, it is not legally justifiable to arrest and imprison people because they are part of someone's network or because of who they work for or who they are related to. That is not due process. That is guilt by association. Pan Tol and Mung Chan Di are just two of the many thousands of victims who were caught up in a CPK witch hunt for enemies burrowing from within, a witch hunt that consumed the regime in 1977 and 1978. I can break here, uh, Mr. President.
en 1977 et en 1978. Je vais m'arrêter là, Monsieur le Président. For the le Président, merci. L'accusation, le moment est venu de lever l'audience. La Chambre va reprendre son audience le 15 juin 2017 à 9h. Demain, la Chambre va continuer to hear the presentation regarding the closing arguments. Please be informed.